second installment of the Border Environment Forum 25. I think yesterday we had a, my, my name is John Beckham, the Deputy Managing Director of the North American Development Bank. And I think yesterday we had a lot of interesting perspectives and a lot of interesting ideas that were exchanged and shared with you all. And I was thinking this morning as I was drinking my coffee, uh, what were the main highlights? And I'm, uh, if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to share a few things to help try to get some synthesis about what we're talking about here today. And we want to carry forward after we leave San Antonio to um, our respective homes, jobs, and challenges uh, as we work on climate change, the, the environment, and the border region. And the first thing that I thought about was I think uh, Ambassador Moctezuma really set us up properly when he said the border region is the backbone of the bilateral relationship between the United States and Mexico. And everything really, that is really what the, the, the bank and the border region is about. Um, many other panelists, many who are from the front, uh, the border region talked, it's really one community with the border in between it. Uh, and so the environmental challenges and the economic potential are one. And we need to keep that in mind as we work through what are the investment needs for the environment and the infrastructure going forward. I think a couple of the other thoughts that came forward to my mind were the, some of the priorities that we should build upon. And the first is the demographic and economic fundamentals of the border region are strong. Uh, we have a young population, there's strong business formation. Uh, there's a dynamite, dynamism in the region based on commerce, uh, trade, education, and technology. That only makes it more important that this fundamental economic dynamism is supported by a sustained guardianship of the environment. That includes the water, energy, transportation, all of this has a cross-cutting theme, which is natural resources and the proper use of those so that they're sustainably supporting the lives of our communities. Uh, and the last point of view that sort of struck out to me strongly was that all of us need to remain engaged in what the border and the bilateral relationship and the trade relationship and the educational and the cultural relationships that undermine that um, relationship the fundamental border region, we need to stay engaged with that. That's not just something I think it was Jerry who said, it's not just a treaty that you come by every 20, 30 years and renegotiate or update. Um, this is really something we need to stay actively engaged upon. And we think that's at the North American Development Bank, that is our role um, to serve that engagement, to serve the investment for the economy and for the environment. So again, I. Those were my thoughts, and I'm sure we can continue those types of um, exchanges on reflections of what's going on and what needs to come. Now, today's agenda is going to build off those things. We're going to talk about some specifics about air and water quality and innovation and technology and what the border, uh, what kind of social investment the border region uh, should start to make concrete. And no pun intended on the concrete side. So to kick off this morning's um, session, if you haven't had enough coffee, I, I, um, we have Norm Anderson, he's, uh, who is a high energy guy, and he, he will kickstart what the caffeine hasn't done already. He's going to offer his vision of the critical role infrastructure plays in sustainable economic and social development. Um, his views are formed by an extensive and diverse experience that I th think is really at the heart of what we want to do, which is uh, support and foment cross, uh, if you will, cross pollination of different ideas and perspectives and experiences to take the best out of each of those. Um, Norm served in the Peace Corps in Paraguay. Um, he ended up marrying a Paraguayan woman, and uh, uh, so I, I know he has a strong affinity with the, the challenges of a regionally uh, an emerging economy. He provided, he has provided, and continues to provide strategic advocacy and advisory on infrastructure and infrastructure investment and economic development as CEO of CGLA. He's also taught as an adjunct professor on engineering and entrepreneurship at Columbia University. 
He's a partner and an investor at CMAG, which is in a transatlantic investment fund dedicated to infrastructure investment. And that's not enough. Certainly surpasses my capacities, especially uh, with, with this handicap I've currently got. Uh, he's written a book. And his latest book, is, uh, this latest work is Vision, A Strategic Roadmap Forward. Now, I read the book even before I knew you were going to distribute them out there, Norm. So I just want to say I did my homework. Uh, I found it a compelling multidimensional analysis for the investments needed for a better and more sustainable future. In particular, I liked um, the, the chapter on uh, strategic infrastructure institutions. And that's what we aspire to be here at NADBank. So I, I really found that... Uh, uh, gratifying and confirming of our, our, our own philosophy here at the bank. So I'm confident Norm's remarks will provoke curiosity and conversation to start our day. So please give a warm welcome to Norm Anderson. Thanks, John. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to try to speak for no more than 15 minutes and then do uh, Q&A. And uh, if you guys get bored, let me know, and then I'll, I'll stop speaking. But what I really want to talk about is this vision idea and just run through a way to think about infrastructure going forward. So here are the topics. The diagram is really, you know, one of the big backdrops for me is, is the fourth industrial revolution, the digitization and electrification of our economy. So... I wrote a book on that, as John said. Um, the real focus is on what I call strategic infrastructure. <clears throat> the vision piece, what is it? Because, you know, we all think of, I think visionaries as people who are a little bit crazy. Um, you know, and, and any, of our, any of us who think of ourselves as visionaries, we probably are crazy. Um, <clears throat> why it's dangerous and then why it's essential for leadership, and especially right now, why it's essential for our future. And then I'll talk a little bit about action and results. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions or if something's not clear. So I wrote a book, Vision, and you know it's really interesting because um, I wrote a book really for the Biden administration, and the idea was that anybody, everybody takes office and they promise to do infrastructure anywhere in the world, they get elected, and then they don't actually know what to do. So I tried to put together a manual of what to do. And, you know, the first thing is that it's strategic infrastructure, building blocks, you build capabilities, you build confidence between the finance sector, the public sector, and the private sector. You create a roadmap. And, and so I, I start the book by saying it's Thanksgiving 2030. And thank, thank goodness we made such great decisions in 2021. So I'm not sure we're doing that, but that's the idea. That's the conceit of the book. It's a roadmap forward, and it's our vision. You know, the interesting thing about infrastructure, you guys, is that infrastructure, if you think about it, it brings everybody together because it really focuses on what we create for ourselves. That's what infrastructure is. It's a creative endeavor. And the piece of that that I just found at the very end of writing the book I just decided to call it vision. I didn't have that idea at the beginning because that seemed what was missing in terms of how not only the U.S. thinks about infrastructure, but every country in the world I'd ever visited that was trying to do infrastructure. Without a big vision, you can't figure out what your priorities are. And the, the thing that I like best, John mentioned that I was a Peace Corps volunteer and my father was in the Marine Corps for 37 years. It's a public good, it creates value for people. And it's our public good. It's, it's what, it creates value for all of us and we all should have a big say in it. Right now, we're in the middle of a giant shift. The fourth industrial revolution, as I said, it's an absolutely decisive decade going forward until 2030. Um, transformative technology explosion AI, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, uh, everything else. Um, and the U.S.-Mexico border, I think, is a huge opportunity for both countries. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity for uh, the U.S. economy. I don't understand why we don't think about the border region much more creatively. And, and I do think it's a, it's a vision issue. 
Then we've got, you know, everything gets lost in the, in the fight between the U.S. and China. But if you look at IoT, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, where we're going with all this, China's actually beating us right now, and that matters. Um, so you've got to think about how you build a North American economy. That's what we're uh, doing. And, you know, the other thing that I think is really important when I talk about the digitization and electrification of the economy, um, infrastructure used to be sort of the backbone or the skeleton of our economy and it made things possible. Now it's the brains of the economy, 30, 40, 50 billion sensors. I mean, I have a Tesla that has 4,000 sensors in it. Um, people building algorithms to determine what our decision sets are going forward. And all of the competitive advantage comes from the analytics around data. So it's a big deal. It transforms pretty much everything that we do. Other issues that are driving how we think about things, this is the global warming piece. Um, that's a pretty scary graph from my, my point of view. You can see what, what's the outlier. It's just the temperature's going up and it's going up way too fast. This is the first industrial revolution, all about water power and steam in the UK. The second industrial revolution, <coughs> electricity and steel at the end of the middle of the 1800s, the US and Germany. The third industrial revolution, computers, telecommunications in the middle of the last century, um, driven mostly by the US. And then the fourth industrial revolution, a very big deal, and being driven mostly by the US and China, to some extent the EU, but it's really being driven by the competition between the US and China. I have to read these things because I can't remember what I wrote, but it's the whole artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomy, and the brains of the economy. And John talked about institutions, and institutions are absolutely critical for everything. All of the institutions that launched the, um, the uh, Industrial Revolution, the first one, were created in the UK after the glorious revolution of 1688. So it's a really big deal. Now it's happening incredibly fast and it's hugely disruptive. I just wanted to highlight the COVID problem as well. This is Latin America and this is Latin American growth and you can see uh, the five biggest Latin American countries. They aren't going to be uh, attaining anywhere near the kind of growth they need for the next five years. Um, everybody's going to be way sub 5% growth. So there's going to continue to be huge pressure all over the region and all over the border area as well. So, you know, one of the things I, I tried to do is think through a 10 year vision for the economy. And it's really interesting if you guys have seen my book, and by the way, I'll, I'll sign it for everybody if you want, it'll, it'll make it worth uh, one cent rather than zero cents. Um, but um, it's really interesting because it's already been translated into Korean because the Koreans love it. It's been translated into uh, Portuguese uh, in Brazil. And then some of the smaller countries in Latin America have invited me to talk about it. And if you read it, it's just a, it's a US book, but it, the paradigm works in other places. So how did we do one, one big issue, I think is the dominance of our national debt. If you, if, you, if you think about the debate in Washington, the bipartisan debate, it always comes down to this issue of nobody knows how to pay for it. So they go on and on and on. We're going to do this, 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 and this. We're going to do this, split this up, da, da, da. and how do we pay for it? And that's, that's stopped everything. Huge competition for resources, giant sense of insecurity, a uh, real sense of failure to the next generation. That's something that people need to think about, at least I need to think about. If we have $30 trillion in debt, that means you're leaving your children each one of your children, something like $85,000 in debt apiece. Uh, it's a big deal. This is what the graph looks like going forward. Um, it'll be twice as much as uh, debt in World War II by 2035. So it's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> without vision, the people perish. That's sort of how I started to think about uh, what we're doing because you need a way to bring everybody together. Otherwise, we just sort of exist as a group that's uh, separated. 
spending on net interest versus other budget areas. This is not meant to depress you guys. This is, but this is a wild graph. So if you look at the transportation figure, we, we spend, let's say, this year, 188 billion in the US on transportation, but 70% of that is operations and maintenance. So it's, it's only a fraction of that goes into new projects. The net interest on our debt is $303 billion. That's this year. Look at what happens by 2031. So it, there's a huge problem. Transportation, everything else goes down. The net interest in our debt heads towards a trillion dollars. Big, giant problem. I did some numbers uh, yesterday, and it's about 25x the amount that we're going to be paying on our national debt in just an in interest versus what we're going to be spending on new transportation infrastructure. So that's that's a huge problem. That's the, in a sense, that's the context for the book and for coming up with a solution. I love my flames, by the way. So this is Moses. Vision brings huge promise. And, you know, I see a huge opportunity for the country, but, you know, it's some, you guys know that the innovation valley of death, well, that's sort of where this country's going over the next 10 years. And the real discussion on infrastructure investment is, is it going to be bold enough and robust enough and targeted enough to make a difference? And are we going to bring our partners to the party as well? So vision, you create something new. It, and you always have vision in a time of danger, turbulence, threat. That's when vision is really important. And it's something that people, it's attractive. You admire it. That you want to get that for everybody. It's, you know, vision, I think, is not an ego-driven thing. I think it's something that we get for all of us and we want for all of us. That's where it really has power. Um, gives us a goal, a purpose, something to achieve. One of the things that's fascinating is that, you know, Moses in the Bible was the visionary. But if you read it, Aaron was the manager, right? I mean, Moses said, I don't know how to talk to the people. I just need to know how to talk to God. And I need a manager. So Aaron was, the, it's fascinating, right? And that's sort of where we are right now. You don't want a visionary running a company. You want a visionary in charge, but you need a manager to run the company. <clears throat> So three ways, vision, where vision comes from, response to a threat, you seize an opportunity, you address a necessity, and what it requires is courage, requires will, what requires tenacity. I love this, this is Billy Mitchell. <clears throat> Billy Mitchell in 1925 was kicked out of the US Army because he said this in San Antonio, Texas, that the US Congress was not doing its job. It was grossly neg negligent. It was criminally incompetent because they didn't recognize the importance of air power and how important air power was gonna be in the next war. And so he got kicked out of his job. He was a true visionary um, and he's the father of the US Air Force. Um, so anyway, wanted to share that with you. Vision is dangerous. You can lose your job, but you can also fail as you're going through the desert, and that's the key issue. I think we, we, what we really need to think about is that there's a new infrastructure paradigm. This is a, a description of a highway that we designed, we have a not-for-profit institute that we designed in Ohio between uh, Canton, Ohio and Pittsburgh. And you guys know how to think about a highway, right? You get money from the federal government or you get money from a public agency. <laughs> And then, you know, you build the highway. Well, we figured out that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different revenue sources from a, from a highway that emphasizes digitization and electrification. Data sales in 5G, the tax delta is you attract advanced manufacturing, advanced logistics, advanced agriculture, uh, land uplift, um, autonomous vehicle and EVs, intermodal, new rights of way, especially for utility corridors. There's just huge opportunities to think of our mobility infrastructure digitally rather than um, in terms of just concrete and steel the way we've thought about it in the past. So 
that's something that's really uh, uh, driving my thinking. So when when um, the Biden people talk about build back better, um, I say, well, why don't we build forward together? Because the vision of the future is just so different from the vision of the past. Um, another thing that's really interesting, I don't know if you can see the green circles, but I was talking to somebody of influence in Washington, and I was saying, you know, hydrogen is going to be really important. That's a big deal. And they said, well, you know, are there any demonstration projects in the country? There's 50 here, huge hydrogen in, in Mexico, in, uh, in Japan, Korea, uh, Germany. And I just wanted to show you all this because, you know, even there's no mention of hydrogen in my book. And even six months ago, if somebody would have said the hydrogen economy is important, I would have looked at them and said, yeah, but I'm a business guy. So, you know, you do that. Right now, I'm 100% convinced that the hydrogen economy is going to drive uh, growth. It's going to drive our environmental goals. I visited the port of Corpus Christi on uh, two days ago. They're building a giant green hydrogen facility. I was at UT Austin yesterday with the hydrogen people. They're building a hydrogen ecosystem in the port of Houston. Um, and it's really going to, it's, it's how we get wind and solar from where it is to where people need it. It's about 25% as expensive to transfer hydrogen molecules than it is to transfer electrons. So just a, a way to think about, at least in my mind, vision drives your priorities. The border, I think, is really interesting. You know, we've, I think, John, you were, we worked with Hans Schultz a long time ago, and the idea was to create a green manufacturing zone south of the border, about 100 kilometers from the Sea of Cortez to the, um, to the Gulf of Mexico, and start to think about really developing that region as sort of a second part of border development, advanced manufacturing, advanced agriculture, advanced autonomy, uh, leading the North American economy. And you know that kind of thing where you just simply change your mental map of a country because we're going through, or a, a region, because we're going through the fourth industrial revolution, I think is really uh, important. Why is it so dangerous? You know, if you look at vision, it's powerful, it's burning. A guy like Billy Mitchell didn't want to get uh, uh, court-martialed from the U.S. Army. You know, he was a general. Um, they retired him as a colonel. But he couldn't help himself. It's like sort of Stephen Jobs not being able to help himself. They have to do this stuff. It's scary. It can consume you. You can fail. And that's the, tr that's the same thing for a person as it is for a country, the sort of valley of death where you go, you make huge investments, you decline, and then you go um, explode in terms of productivity and opportunity and equity for people. But it's really lonely to make those decisions. It's easier to keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, this is Moses in the burning bush. Wasn't a good time for Moses, um, <clears throat> but he had to do it. And that's sort of how I see vision in our country. So. Um, a couple of action items, mental action items, going to John's introduction. The first one is that infrastructure is actually a first order priority, which I find fascinating in the sense that if you go to the White House and you ask who's in charge of infrastructure, there's some per person three levels down in the National Economic Council whose job it is to write memos on infrastructure. And you know what, what they need, <clears throat> is an infrastructure office in the White House that's strategic and innovative, that really drives innovation so that people who understand infrastructure can talk to them, because economists don't understand infrastructure, and they're invested in not understanding infrastructure. Because <laughs> if, 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 if they admit how complex it is to do a project on the finance, technology, um, engineering, construction side, the risk, et cetera, um, they'd have to bring in experts. Uh, we need a national infrastructure bank, similar to NADBank, strategic and it's a funding source, uh, and we need state infrastructure banks. But I really think NADBank is a fantastic model 
because it, it, it fits squarely into this business of creating a vision for the future. It's strategic, it's a funding organization, and it's driving innovation, right? So, you know, if I think about NADBank and what it is and, and its role, I think about NADBank as a, a critical institution for going forward. I like this map, map here. Do you guys, this is the guy at UT Austin showed me this map yesterday. And the, the whole point of this map was to prove that everything is in Texas. I mean, the guys from Texas, Texas is the biggest, everything's wonderful in Texas. But I started to think about this map. I liked the map, I thought it was cool, right? So, you know, oil and gas, it ends in Texas. Wind, Texas. Solar, Texas. But then I realized, what's, what's wrong with this map? Anybody have any idea? Yeah, where the hell's Mexico? I mean, how do you how do you do this, right? And that kind of thing really does limit you. It limits you guys' job, but it's a crazy um, problem that we have because the U.S. is only going to be competitive in the fourth industrial revolution with Mexico as a really, really vibrant partner. We're getting older and older. We don't have labor. Um, we have all sorts of issues. And, and Mexico is a fantastic source of everything, right? From reshoring to coming up with new ways to think about the economy to the labor issue. I, I just think that it's crazy not to come up with a really positive, rich, layered, and promising view of uh, the future. So fix the damn map. Um, Fix the map, there you go, my point. And the, the, now a more practical point about vision. Once you have a vision, you know, I, I, I live in Washington and I fight with these guys all the time because again, Build Back Better sounds to me like um, Joe Biden, when he still had hair, is gonna drive down the highway in a Mustang convertible and it's gonna blow his hair back, right? He's gonna have a nice highway without potholes. What we're building is, is so different from that in terms of our future, what's gonna allow us to have good lives, be productive, et cetera. <clears throat> so if you have a vision, you start to think about what your priorities are and you can measure those against other projects. And most of the um, uh, old projects, old types of projects, unless you digitize and electrify those projects, those aren't going to be particularly productive projects. That's how you have to think about it. If you digitize those and if you electrify those, they actually generate their own revenue sources. So there's a whole different way of thinking about infrastructure. And then I have the, you know, the sort of classic, once you uh, catch the wave of the future, then you build projects that are really going to drive uh, growth. They're going to drive environmental goods and they're going to drive equity. I, you know, the examples I use are the, uh, TCW project, which is bringing um, transmission, bringing wind power to Los Angeles from Wyoming, and it's about 8,000 megawatts, uh, and it's the first uh, high velocity, uh, high value transmission project in the U.S. since about 1978. It's a big deal. Um, offshore wind projects, a western hydrogen highway project. Visionary projects, projects that really matter in terms of uh, digitization, electrification, those are the projects to really prioritize and think about. Um, so I wrote a book, and there it is, and thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Do I have any time for questions? Am I over two minutes? Okay, great. I, look, I saw you first, and then you, if that's okay. This is the only time in my life when I have power, so this is great. You first, and then you. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you. I'm aware about the, the how, how much every company must invest in research and development. No. Because, no? No, who, who, what company is that? What, what, are you, what, are, what, what do you think about the investment that we need to do in the border? for do this kind of uh, of uh, innovation because sometimes we invest only when the project is sure the success yeah but nobody think in about the value of the failure like uh, to invest and then failure 
but the 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 lesson learned that we can get from that failing and and because we are in a velocity issues right and we have the past of the slow <laughs> investment yeah you may know no that's a that's a really uh, i think that's a great observation and john you know that's Really, how when I started to put together the presentation, this presentation, by the way, yeah, you know, I hope, I'm glad you liked it. I mean, it kept me up forever because I was trying to make it relevant for you guys, and you, you end up learning a lot. And you know, it just strikes me that there's got to be a better way to think about the border to make the kinds of investments that are going to make the kinds of investments possible, right? You've got to learn from mistakes, and you've got to figure out how to, you know, sort of break things fast, is what those horrible people at Facebook say. And, but you've got to figure out how to do that in infrastructure at the border because the border's been a taboo topic for you know four or five years in Washington. It's been, you know, this is the problem. And my point is this is where all the opportunity for the U.S. economy is along the border. But you're going to have to digitize and electrify the whole region and, and figure out what you want to produce there and what you're going to bring back from China and reshore and create a really strong North American economy. You know, you guys are doing that, but I don't see a lot of people doing that. And, and that really, that would be one of my biggest priorities um, in terms of, you know, getting people in Washington to think clearly about how to build our economy. Does that make sense? Is that an okay answer? Thanks. Yeah, my name is Avner Adin, I'm from Israel. Uh, thank you for your lecture, very nice. And uh, as a descendant of the people who went out of Egypt with Moses and Joshua, <laughs> personally uh, thankful. I'd like to support you, what you said uh, in the relationship between vision and, and real management uh, by having two facts from that times, okay? <laughs> facts, yes. One, um, when the people of Israel in the desert, they didn't have water. Moses took a stick and struck a rock, and then water came out. <laughs> but he forgot to write a patent. So today we have to work very hard in order to get water. <laughs> <laughs> That's in my next slide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing in this respect is that uh, with his great vision, he visioned the, the land of Israel. You know, where, where it was the land of Canaan. Uh, with all the troubles and rocks and so forth, um, instead of leading Israel, when he came to the Sinai Desert to the right to go to Saudi Arabia with the oil, he took to the left to the land of Israel. So you are very right in what you said. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Before you run, Calixto and John, if I can have you come up, please. Jonathan. Oh, thank you. Thank you again, Norm. Appreciate you being here. I would like to uh, invite Salvador Lopez up. Salvador is, uh, serves as the bank's chief environmental officer. He oversees the environmental integrity of the operations of the bank and projects being considered for not financing. Salvador has over 20 years of significant experience in environment, water, and sustainability, including experience along the U.S.-Mexico border. Salvador will come up to moderate uh, the keynote chat, and Salvador will introduce uh, our keynote panelist. Hello.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us for this second date. I think we've had a, a very interesting conference in that, uh, in addition to the quality of the speakers, the diversity of topics has been has been pretty interesting to me. We, we talked about USMCA and the economy, mobility, urban development, and later on we'll be talking about water. And a lot of the more uh, typical types of conversations we used to have at NatBank, but we've also had quite a quite a you know a few different topics uh, in terms of innovation, uh, in terms of environmental justice and social inclusion later today, uh, and, and certainly uh, the conversation we're about to chat is a little bit off the beaten path uh, for some of us. Uh, so with that context, I'm I'm very uh, happy to present Trinity Lloyd. Uh, Trinity is the sales and strategy lead of the energy transition and sustainable practice at Google Cloud. Prior to joining Google, Trinity spent over 20 years in various roles at top technology organizations such as Dell, Cisco, Rackspace, and VMware. Her primary expertise lies in pairing internal corporate solutions and strategies with market-driven and large-scale business transformation priorities. Uh, she's responsible for aligning Google's vast inventory of digital sustainable solutions and operating principles with the SDG initiatives organizations are facing today. Trinity focuses her efforts on leveraging these proven solutions and opt opt optimally position organizations for new market opportunities while simultaneously progressing them toward a more resilient and profitable future. Trinity, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So let me start with just a, a, kind of like a, a question set to, to set up the stage. We, we've all heard about Google, I think. We all use the verb to Google. And we've also heard the term the cloud, right? But I think I think for some of us who are uh, over 20 years old, it's it's sometimes a little bit of a, of, a, of a vague concept. You know, what exactly is the cloud? What does it do? But also what it looks like, right? There, there's something behind it in terms of physical infrastructure. So just to set the stage, can you describe a little bit what Google Cloud is and, and what it does? Uh, Google Cloud is all of the computers, the servers, the uh, the hard drives, the information that Google uses um, to support your search, your YouTube videos, um, and, uh, and an infrastructure of data centers, essentially in networks, connecting us uh, all over the world. And all it is is just a whole bunch of computers that are connected. Um, and, uh, and Google Cloud specifically is the culmination of all of those pieces turned externally for, uh, for other entities to use. So because we have so many data centers, so many servers, so much information, um, and we got really, really good at how to do this at scale, we started turning that uh, opportunity, that expertise, um, and some of those assets out to other organizations. So historically, your uh, uh, computer or IT uh, operations might be internal to your building. You might have your own data center. What the cloud does is offers you an opportunity to kind of focus on your core competencies at whatever type of organization you are, and your IT is is in our data center, essentially. Give us a sense of, of uh, what a server farm, if that's the right term, looks like, maybe in terms of like football stadiums or, or something that we can grasp. Oh, there are, there's definitely football stadiums. Uh, there's, they're all different sizes, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but multiple football stadiums football stadiums could also be used. Um, and uh, so I'll give you an example in terms of energy, because that's mm -hmm. kind of the language I speak. Um, our data centers consume more electricity than uh, several countries, um, more than uh, San Francisco, Bay Area, multiple times a year. So uh, we, ha you know, our data centers are like three or four times uh, San Francisco, Bay Area. So we consume a ton of, le of electricity and that, and we grow about couple hundred percent every year, not in terms of electricity consumption, uh, but but in terms of uh, just general growth because data is exploding. That's, that's very interesting because you, you read about it in the context of Bitcoin mining, right? The amount of energy that Bitcoin <laughs> mining uh, consumes. And sometimes uh, you almost feel like you you don't live in a physical world, right? It's, yes. Everything's in your, in your, in the in your cell phone. But in the <laughs> matrix, correct. But, but behind it, I think there's real challenges in terms of resource consumption, being Absolutely. energy for sure. Uh, I assume land uh, can be a, a constraint for, for you guys to expand. Yep. I don't know how, how much you use in terms of water and other resources, but, but I, I would assume that's a, a challenge for you. It is. As a matter of fact, so we, um, 
we data centers in general are about three percent of the world's emissions, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to continue to grow in terms of data center size. Cl clouds are continuing to grow. Data is con continuing to grow, and and to to Norm Norm's point earlier, as we continue to electrify, uh, that's going to also continue to grow. So we expect it to just kind of explode. Um, and the core of kind of who Google is, uh, just just based on what we what our what our core beliefs are and what we value. We, we endeavor to kind of solve some of the challenges with that growth. We want to leave the world a better place than we found it. And so we've been working on that challenge, which is a very big, complex challenge for a long time. Um, we, we went to carbon neutrality in 2007, um, and primarily that started with offsets, but also with understanding our, our electricity demand, how it changes, how it alternates in regions. Um, what the carbon intensity is, uh, what the water implications are, and how how we can create innovations across different regions to impact that. So um, we, you know, starting from carbon offsets and moving towards really eliminating our carbon legacy with our action, um, using machine learning, using uh, electrification and digitization. Um, and last year, we eliminated our carbon legacy for the inception of our company. So uh, all the way back to the 90s, uh, we have no carbon footprint um, in terms of offset and, uh, and our reductions. However, uh, our next goal, our next objective is to go to 24-7 carbon free in every region. And since we're a global company, we're 180,000 or so employees, that's a big goal, and it requires lots of uh, collaboration, lots of um, global partnerships, because it really is about changing uh, the, the electric grids and availability all over the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot, but we have learned a lot of fun lessons along the way, mm -hmm. uh, and how we tackle some of these big, giant world problems. Um, obviously, we're, we've done it in the context of our world, but um, we've, we've created a lot of innovation uh, mm -hmm. in that practice. So I guess getting to carbon neutral, uh, the, the first thing you would think about is renewable energy, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I guess it takes more than that. Uh, yesterday, someone was explaining the scope one, scope two, scope three emissions and the like. So in addition to having uh, solar panels on, on your roof, so to speak, uh -huh. what else are you doing? How are you engaging uh, countries? Mm -hmm. and, you know, in the case, as you mentioned, the, your global operations, how are you engaging cities, your employees? You know, it's a quick question to what yep. time. To what extent can you uh, sway your employees to uh, greener uh, commutes and lifestyles and so yeah. forth? Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, and it's it's a lot. So it's a multifaceted approach that you certainly have to take, uh, particularly with scope one through three. Uh, scope three can be particularly challenging because you have to impact uh, things you don't control. Uh, you have to create behavioral changes, incentives, things like that. Um, but we start with uh, we start with what we can what we can control in scope one and two. Um, we incorporate circularity into everything that we do. So uh, we have, a, I think it's around 97% landfill diversion now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's about creating an infrastructure internally to support, uh, you know, reducing waste and reusing what we have. You know, we have manufacturing facilities. So we, um, we implement circular economies for uh, recycled plastics. Um, and, and we're a data center company, so we have a lot of our electricity consumption comes from cooling. And so depending on where our data centers are located, we implement all kinds of uh, technologies. Could be green roofs, it could be um, uh, air cooling in certain cooler regions, it could be um, uh, recycled wastewater from sewage uh, treatment facilities. So uh, it depends on what the regional implications are. Mm -hmm. Uh, because contextual insight is important, but uh, but we we try to tackle it on all all realms, and it's pieces and parts over time that add up to significant change. But you do have to support the infrastructure. You have to be committed to it, and you have to be willing to um, really understand the problem, uh, and uh, and and all of the other things that that problem affects. Yeah. Great. So th there was a talk, one of the panelists or a couple of the panelists yesterday were talking about uh, ESG goals and how they're here to stay uh, oh, yeah. for, for different players, the, certainly for the banks like us, for, for you guys. Uh, but what is really driving, motivating Google to, to, to establish and commit by these ESG goals? I, I, I mean, I, I know Google is the do no evil company, if I remember yeah. correctly. 
but but beyond that, what what else is behind it? Uh, I guess some people would wonder: Does it pay off to 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 have these targets? So if you can talk about the different drivers of it, both financial but but otherwise. Sure. Um, so it, so we do it because uh, our core core philosophy is do no evil. Um, and uh, and so in the beginning, it wasn't cost effective. We had to learn uh, what some of our challenges were. Um, and we were willing to take a cost um, hit over the long term uh, because we did feel that uh, it was core. It was a core tenant to who we are. Um, and we do take a, a little bit of a different philosophy at Google, uh, which is you maintain sort of what what your core competency is, your core value. You maintain innovation, and you do that for what the entire world wants and needs, um, leaving no one out. Uh, so every user and 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 ultimately we believe the money will follow uh, and it, it's worked so far so, so we've continued to adopt that philosophy but we certainly do um, we certainly do take consideration for what the cost versus the the impact is and the way that you do that is by understanding large amounts of information particularly in this space and and then how can we impact some of the infrastructure and, and challenges in that space right now? So I'll give you an example. Um, you mentioned renewable energy earlier. Um, you know, we were one of the first to start working with um, the Norwegian and Finnish governments on uh, on bringing renewable energy and wind farms into that region to do some of the first direct uh, large purchase agreements. So mm -hmm. really kind of transforming some of the opportunities for other large corporations uh, to impact um, on site uh, what their what their energy options were. Mm -hmm. So and that ultimately was good for us, right? Because uh, in the beginning, it cost us more to make some of these decisions. Um, and, but as we go on and we get smarter and better about it, it's become a differentiator for us. It's become a, a core tenant of our brand. Um, and and we find cost savings along the way. Circular economy principles are are very cost effective. Mm -hmm. So if we can if we can implement those, um, waste becomes quite valuable. Great. Yes, and I was making the comment yesterday that sometimes uh, non-technical people think of of innovation as as the new gadget, right? But mm -hmm. but you're describing also a lot of innovation in terms of the business models, the cooperation with the host countries, yep. the contractual agreements for the supply and energy and so forth. So, so I think that's, that's part of the formula you've, you've been. Uh, Absolutely, we, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a common statement at Google, which is make it 10 X. So whatever your idea is, whatever your gadget idea is, whatever your, whatever your core focus is, now imagine if you, if you just go 10 times that, what, what's the impact, what's the potential? And so a lot of people within the organization are very, and, and it draws a lot of people to the organization because of this, but they're very focused on what could I really do? What, if, the, if, the, if there was a sky is no limit moonshot opportunity, and uh, what, what, what could I potentially do? So if you have a great idea, that's nice, mm -hmm. but, but how do you multiply that times 10? And that kind of innov innovative spirit uh, yeah. impacts every part of the, uh, the our, our part of the operation. Great, thank yeah. you. So let me change gears a little bit. We, we've talked so far mostly about the operations and what you do to conserve resources, to have your own internal climate and, and ESG goals and so forth. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about, I was surprised when I first ch started chatting with you about this uh, today's uh, meeting is that the, the actual uses of the cloud and the data you collect for sustainability purposes I find that very impressive because I thought the cloud was mostly to to upload my the photos of my dog, right? <laughs> Which I'm sure there's a that lot too. of that. But then I saw I saw some of the things you're doing. And it was very impressive. I don't know if you want to talk about it. I think you might have some sure, slides. Sure, yeah, I have some slides. Uh huh. Yeah. Maybe we can spend. So, um, so some of the things that we do when you think about Alphabet broadly, we have lots of different uh, different brands. Uh, you know, Google Maps, etc. And all of these all of these core things that we do. So if you think about all the Nest thermostats all over the world, um, that's a lot of data on energy demand, on energy consumption, on, on weather impacts. If you think about um, uh, Waymo and uh, electric autonomous vehicles, we can understand a lot. In, and uh, we have 90 petabytes of geospatial data that we've integrated, right? So pulling all of these different data components together, 
we are constantly, and, and, and thinking in terms of what is the 10x of the data that we own, we are constantly thinking about what could we do with this. What can we do with this that helps the, helps the world, helps the planet, and helps every user? And so we do things like um, have an entire uh, time lapse of the globe uh, in terms of uh, terrain and geospatial data. We have things like uh, you know uh, deforestation, so understanding how our forests are changing over time. We create platforms like Global uh, Surface Explorer, which essentially uh, is what is every freshwater uh, reservoir on the planet and over time, collecting that over time. Uh, it's kind of amazing some of the things that you can do with data when you think about it in a creative way and start to integrate it. And, uh, and that's our core mission. Our core mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Uh, that's how you have search. But uh, what, how, can you, how can you 10x search? Well, anything that you need to understand about our Earth, our planet, and how we go uh, go about, you know, wor working together and living together, exists in a data set somewhere. So if you can start integrating those data sets, uh, you can start to have real interesting contextual insights, uh, and 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 make really interesting decisions and choices about what your actions are. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tools that you probably uh, are refer we're referring to mostly is we have a so if you think about uh, androids, right, because uh, androids have little pings and, and when you think about maps and you take trips and you understand kind of a lot about where people go and what, and, and uh, not specific people, just to be clear, <laughs> <laughs> aggregated anonymous people, uh, but you understand uh, 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 activity, right? And you can also understand with, uh, with, with trips data and android data, you can understand things like building size. You can understand building location. So when you start pulling these things together, we created a platform for, and this is a free platform, by the way, um, for cities, communities, and large organizations to understand their contextual large carbon emission challenges. So um, if you take all the transportation emissions, multimodal transportation emissions in a city, um, what does that equal? And how is that changing over time? And what policy might you implement to reduce those emissions? Same for buildings. So we understand uh, we understand building size, type, population, um, weather in each each geographic area. So what are the building emissions for uh, that entire city? And how could you impact that? Let's say we're going to do a big development. What impact does that have on the city's uh, uh, carbon emissions? And then finally, the, the, the fun and exciting one that I love to tell people about is Project Sunroof, which is the third component of this platform. And that is every single rooftop all over the world, uh, we're not quite to a global scale yet, but we're pretty close, um, it has an opportunity for uh, rooftop solar in some form or fashion. And so this platform takes uh, all of those components that I just mentioned, and uh, you can put your address in, and it will, in just a couple of minutes, tell you, is this an ideal rooftop for solar? Why or why not? Is the incline too high? Does it have too much shade? Um, and if, and let's say it is. Let's say it's, a, let's, it, it's good, it's decent, it's borderline. It will tell you what the energy savings is over time, what the cost savings is over time, and, uh, and what the emission savings is. And if you can aggregate that across an entire city or municipality, mm -hmm. uh, you can make some decisions on policy. You can make some collaborative uh, uh, partnerships on investment, and you can really impact uh, change quickly. And so we bring these things together, and uh, and it's really just about kind of helping the world make uh, make use of our data in a way that's going to positively impact everyone. Mm -hmm. And are you are you alluded to this uh, a little bit already? But in terms of that. Uh, potential end users getting access to the data. And, and again, I understand, uh, I think it was you, Diego, or someone who was talking yesterday about the difficulty in, in analyzing the data, right? Mm -hmm. I was surprised to, uh, if I understood one of the speakers correctly, in a thousand houses in Austin, they collect a billion data points in a day, if I understood correctly. So the question is like, what do you do with that data, right? So, so, so you guys collected but in terms of the analytic to to make it usable, so to speak, is that is that something uh, Google also spends a lot of time doing, or is that more on the end of the users to 
to make sense of that. Of that no, data. no, it's definitely what we, we spend a lot of time doing because data is just data until you make it information. Mm -hmm. So uh, because, of, because we're so focused on innovation and empowering every employee to innovate to 10x, uh, we give a lot of freedom for, um, for people to come up with ideas on how to make that data useful information. Um, however, I want to be very clear, uh, it doesn't mean everybody in Google has access to everybody's energy data points. Uh, they have that very locked down um, and everything becomes quickly aggregated and, and, uh, and diluted to a degree that you could never uh, mm -hmm. violate policy uh, privacy. However, um, the, the ideas of what we could do with data, like who would have thought, I mean, I know when I heard about this platform, Android pings tell somebody how big a building is so that they can then calculate uh, what, a, what a carbon emission and energy consumption is. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm glad Google does things like that with, with ping data because otherwise that would just be sitting there. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very difficult, but I think the fact that we have history in search, the fact that our core competency is around harmonizing data and making it useful, mm -hmm. um, that helps us figure out how to take these big, giant, vast, disparate data components and, and bring them together and make information. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, Jesse, but let me, we still have, we still have time. Let me open the floor to see who, who might have any, any questions uh, for, for Trinity Gustavo, please, and then uh, the lady in blue. Hi, good Hi. morning. Thank you, Trinity, very much. Absolutely. Um, so I represent the Smart Border Coalition, the San Diego Tijuana Smart Border mm -hmm. Coalition. I have a challenge for Google. Uh, and that challenge is how we see border mobility and how we analyze border mobility. One of the problems we have at the border is we don't have enough data. We have a lot of crude data, right, mm -hmm. of people crossing. But we, we don't know how to aggregate the data. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been working, my organization and others, on a border dashboard. Okay. okay so we want to know at any particular time what the state of the border is. Okay. And that's always been an issue. Okay. And there's various uh, uh, initiatives going on as far as setting up equipment and Wi-Fi readers and what have you at the border. But you, of all organizations in the world, are best positioned because you already track traffic at the border. You track traffic every, anywhere in the world. Yep. So my challenge is how can we work with Google at the border to make sure that we have the intelligence as to how transportation is affecting you know, movement from one side of the border to the other and back because we have a circular economy in most of these border pair cities. Mm -hmm. So how can we get a project of sufficient magnitude going on through you yeah. We've tried to reach Google in the past. We just have been unable to do it. Okay, because I don't think Google has- You got has... Google spaghetti. <laughs> yes, well, we haven't, we, we, we've never thought that Google actually placed enough priority at the border because you have so many things going on, as mm -hmm. you just explained. But in terms of what Norm say, was saying this morning, a few minutes ago, this is what it's about. It's, yeah. it's how do we work with you? I don't want to work with, you know, I want to start doing something, reinvent the wheel, when you have, have reinvented the wheel. Okay, yep. why don't we work together? We're yep. trying to work out a smart border, like smart cities for Qualcomm yep. uh, in San Diego to, to make sure that they get interested in infrastructure for the border. Why, why don't we involve Google in this whole process? I'm happy to, I'm happy to support that. Um, and and, and uh, part, of, part of the cloud uh, organization has grown out because Google Spaghetti has been a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, how, who do I talk to who's working on these types of things, right? Um, and the cloud organization gives us an opportunity to interact externally more um, and have more representation to uh, internally go find the right resources and people. And that's a big part of my job, uh, connecting all the dots across uh, organizations externally and internally because it is a massive company. Um, and at any one time, we might have a hard time finding it ourselves. However, uh, I spend a lot of time doing this. So I would be happy to support um, setting up some connections for you and, and have have conversations. I, I love the idea of the project. So, thank you. That's great. Thank you. And uh, next person, please. And then the gentleman on this side, and you want to, and then Memo, please. Yeah, um, Adriana Zuniga from the University of Arizona. I have two concerns. 
Uh, the first one is about security, and um, I'm trusting Google. I love the cloud. I trust it with all my data, my presentation, and everything is better than my hard drive. But what happens if it, there's a natural disaster or a hacker or someone um, in, in that source? I, I know you have backup for the backup for the backup, but uh, also cybersecurity in terms of threats of hackers. Um, so that's one of the concerns. And the second one, we've heard about urban sprawl in this conference, about consumption of natural resources, deforestation, one of your own apps. And I know that data centers take a lot of space, a lot of energy, consume a lot of resources, and data is exploding. So it's going to be exponentially more. So where's the limit on this consumption? Are we going to be looking at an Earth that looks at data centers all over the planet? Where, where is it stopping? Is there uh, some limit to that growth? So the so let me start with the first uh, security question, because that's um, the other one's a little more complicated. However, so from a, secu so from a security perspective, there probably isn't, uh, and I actually think this may have been tested, an organization that is uh, threatened from hacking more than, more than Google. We have uh, more expertise in security than, than any organization out there um, and have, uh, have, have worked at this uh, for a long time because of that. So uh, we, face, we face that nonstop, um, and it's why we have um, uh, uh, we, why we should be able to, although sometimes it goes in the opposite, uh, be able to provide greater confidence on security because we have the, the most security experts uh, there are uh, it, within Google working on this nonstop in the very basis, uh, basic um, way to articulate it. So if, uh, if you send something through the mail or if you have something on your own personal hard drive, it is far less secure. <laughs> Uh, than if it's in the cloud, and uh, not just in not just in terms of redundancy, because the redundancy is uh, instantaneous and duplicated in multiple uh, multiple areas. So when we talk about Google uh, and Google's data centers, they're they're the biggest and and reg most regionally spread, and we also have our own fiber networks, right? So uh, we we have the most redundancy and. When have you ever gone to Google and it and it and it been down? Right? There's uh, catastrophes all over the world. Have you ever had a hard time going and getting your search to work? Right? We are the most reliable and most secure, and that's that. There's a reason for that. It's because we are as big as we are, um, and we impact as much as we do, and and also because we take security extremely seriously, internally and and how, with how we interact with the world. The second question. Um, so I think it's it's there is a there is a responsibility for data center organizations and technology organizations to reduce the impact as much as possible, and we are getting smarter and smarter about that. Um, and reusing our water, uh, and and uh, we've even reduced the size of our chips uh, and the energy intensity, so we continue to innovate in those ways. But the but we're not we, we can't stop right now, and the reason we can't stop right now is because there are a lot of data gaps in terms of sustainability. And we have to fix those data gaps to make the correct and accurate interventions to solve some of the challenges we face in, in the world. So um, I'm not sure where the line is, to be perfectly honest with you, um, but, uh, but we are getting smarter and smarter about how we do it. And I think we are also pushing uh, our competitors to do the same. We've probably seen a lot of um, uh, other cloud providers and other technology companies really focusing on this now. Um, and, and it's because we set a bar and we said this is our responsibility. And so I hope that the, that the impact from data centers, uh, even, even as they continue to scale and grow, um, is significantly reduced over the next couple of years. Uh, we'll, we're doing all we can. We're opening up our technology, our expertise, our learned lessons to anybody that wants them, frankly. Uh, to help people scale and, and accelerate their own efforts in this space. And that's what we can do. But I, I, I don't want it to stop because we still have some things we have to figure out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we, we've come to our time. Uh, let's please thank Trinity for making the trip. Thank you. Thank you. Trinity, thank you so much. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you very much.
We're going to be moving on to the Environmental Justice and Social Inclusion Panel. Uh, I'd like to call up Marco Nieto Vasquez, uh, the panelist for, I mean, the moderator for the panel. Marco is a partner at Baker McKenzie's Energy, Mining, and Infrastructure Industry Group in Mexico City. He has over 17 years of international consulting experience in the private sector, Mexico public sector, and international energy related organizations. Marco. I would also like to take this time to call up Janie Barrera, President and CEO of Lift Fund, Hector Garza uh, from Rick Mueller, and Gustavo Alaniz, Director of the Centro Mexicano de Derechos Ambiental. And fill up the microphones, please, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Thank you to NatBank to let me discuss this very important part of the of the topic because at the end if we we cannot plan or design any kind of project in the border or any any place in the world if we don't understand what is the impact on social issues and of course the environmental rights that according to the last recent events on how is the environmental uh, right for the for the people is trying to be included in those projects not only for infrastructure in energy and water but whatever what we can try to plan or, or design as policy maker as developer as non-governmental organization is very relevant to understand what is the social impact. Let me start with um, to introduce to my colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, Hector, Jane, Gustavo. Um, I think that we need to start with the general regulatory framework for, because we have several local state um, and municipal jurisdiction, but it's very relevant to understand what is the regulatory framework in that part, because at the end we need to understand to each other in the border what uh, we need to plan or uh, including in our perspectives for, for that discussions. Uh, Hector, what is the general regulatory framework for this uh, kind of, 
of issue and how we need to include in our projects those. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Marco, for that. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, honored to be uh, in this panel. Uh, I want to say thanks to NetBank or all the people who, uh, all the persons who are present here and to this amazing panel. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I was not prepared, but I brought a presentation. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so, well, let me uh, walk you through uh, a legal technicality that uh, is actually very relevant to understand uh, how uh, a big difference between Mexico and U.S. and Canada uh, that perspires along and drips along our, all our legal framework and, and the way that we understand in Mexico uh, our constitution. So uh, traditionally, and this is prior to 011, uh, the way that uh, Mexico word, it, it worked is that we had a, our constitution at the highest level, then our laws, then regulations, and then agreements, uh, resolutions, and the like. This changed in 011. In 011, our constitution was reformed, uh, Article 1st, and a, a, a very uh, significant change was implemented. And that is, for all legal purposes, the Mexican Constitution is not only the text of the 120-something articles. We have to add to that every single human rights treaty that Mexico has entered into and ratified, and every single jurisprudence issued by the Inter-American Human Rights Court regardless of the fact that Mexico participated or not in that case. And we, and now, we, when we talk about the Mexican Constitution, we don't talk about the text. We talk about the constitutional block. So it's, it's a mashup of, of legal documents, and that is our Constitution. And every single federal, state, municipal law must abide and comply with the constitutional block. That's the catch. So whenever you're talking about human rights in Mexico, it's not only the Constitution, but every single human rights treaty and every single jurisprudence issued by the Inter American Human Rights Court. And that's a very big difference. Uh, one of this and uh, one of the most relevant documents that has been passed by this administration and ratified is the Escazú Agreement. This is brand new. This just happened some months ago. Um, the Escazú Agreement, uh, it's an in, in international treaty, uh, which uh, its idea generally is to place equality at the center of sustainable development and leaving no one behind. And the, uh, the idea is to bring some of the uh, OBSs uh, from the Agenda 2030 uh, and, and being built into the Mexican legal system. Um, you can see in the presentation the key elements, uh, but you can summarize this agreement at uh, a, a, a very, uh, very, very simple level. And that is the, uh, the Escazú Agreement recognizes access to env environmental information and participation as a human right. And that is a huge difference. Uh, for example, when in Mexico we carry out an environmental impact assessment, step number one is to carry out public consultation. This public consultation, it was uh, quirky and it was uh, just uh, not absolutely clear if I, as a citizen, had a right to participate, unless I was being affected by a specific project. Escazú Agreement makes that abundantly clear. I can participate. And it is not only that I can participate, but it is my human right to participate. And if an authority defaults or breaches my human right, I can access a constitutional trial, we call Amparo Lawsuit, and demand my participation. And Nescaso Agreement, again, is the Constitution. So that drips along not only at a federal level, but also a municipal level, and also at a state level. So, for example, I want to uh, question my neighbor uh, building an XYZ construction. I can get access to environmental inf information associated with that project through Nescaso directly. And I can demand to participate in that process through Nescaso. 
This is still at a constitutional level. Let's see how this drips along the Mexican legal system. And this will be, be interesting in the next couple of years. So this was a, a huge uh, leap forward by this administration, and this will have very significant impacts along, along our legal system. Uh, second, ILO Convention 169. Um, so ILO Convention 169, it's a huge thing in Mexico and Latin America and some uh, countries in Europe. Um, ILO Convention, uh, basically, uh, it's, a, it, it's a document uh, that is uh, the formal name. It's uh, the Convention Concerning Indigenous uh, Peoples and Tribal Peoples in Independent Countries, ILO Convention 169. Um, so the idea of this document is uh, to ensure uh, due participation of indigenous peoples in the decision-making process whenever a legislative or administrative act could affect their rights. So um, basically the idea is that whenever the government is going to, and I'll, I'm oversimplifying this, this, this uh, convention is very complex and its implication has been, have been humongous uh, at a Latin American level, um, but the idea is if a government is going to pass a law or is going to grant a permit to develop any kind of project, they must consult with indigenous peoples that could be, that could possibly be affected in their rights because of this administrative or legislative act. Not in their property, and this is something that is, that is essential, is not only about if they own a piece of property or they possess a piece of property. Uh, ILO Convention defines the rights as a cultural territory, not ownership, territory. And that encompasses the ecosystem to which this community or, or tribe could have a relationship with, culturally or physically. Um, and obviously, in some cases where there's a significant impact, consent is required. It's not only consult, it's consent when a significant impact occurs. So this is humongous. If, uh, if, if, if we look at, uh, at the permitting process or a legislative process, this is a game changer. Uh, this has been implemented in Mexico and ratified since 1991, but it's only after 2011 that, uh, that actual implementation occurred. And this has been um, a, a headache uh, for most energy projects in Mexico because the two first laws uh, in Mexico that actually verbalize this obligation are the hydrocarbon law and the electric industry law. Um, and uh, even though, again, and I, I'm, I go back to my first slide, even though this, only these two federal laws spelled it out, it, this is a constitutional obligation. So this drips along naturally or across the board in all the Mexican legal system. So every once in a while, we do run into highway, tollways, or any kind of infrastructure project that fail to comply with this obligation. And naturally, that would cause nullity of all the related permits or even pieces of legislation as a whole. Uh, this obligation that seems probably at a US or Canadian level, a little bit far off or far away. I want to just call your attention to the uh, Equator Principles uh, EP4. As we all know, uh, the new version of Equator Principles was uh, published in, back in July, uh, July 2020, and it uh, became implemented uh, back in October 2020. So this is this exists, this, uh, this is valid, this is what uh, over 68 uh, banks and financing entities and multilaterals are already working with. So this document calls for ethic, free prior and informed consultation. It is a natural part of equator principles. And here's the catch. Before uh, the EP, EP4, uh, designated countries such as US and Canada uh, did not have to comply with IFC 7, uh, and that changed. Uh, now, regardless of the fact of you being a designated or not designated country, i.e. US and Canada, are bound to comply with ethnic not under ILO Convention 169. There are differences, subtle differences. But when you go to the text, we can see 
Equator principles intent is to come on. What are equator principles? This is a general introduction. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what, what the document says initially. We will not provide project finance, project related corporate loans to projects or project related refinance and project related acquisitions finance to projects which do not comply with the relevant equator principle requirements. And boom, here we go. Principle five, stakeholder engagement. All projects affecting indigenous peoples will be subject to a process of informed consultation and participation. And specifically, for certain type of projects, you would jump to IFC Performance Center 7, paragraphs 13 through 17, uh, where uh, they would require free prior and informed consent. So this is relevant for, for financing purposes. This is different. And this is something that we all need to be very aware. Uh, uh, regardless of any country being designated or not designated, that went away, that disappeared. And this requirement has to be at the center of focus of any project financing or project development uh, across the globe, if you want to get financing from any of these uh, financing companies. Um, um, again, these are some technicalities, uh, but again, Equator Principles EP4 uh, do also recognize the existence of, of significant impacts as a trigger for FPIC. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and again, reiterates over the fact that this is mandatory for purposes of uh, getting approval for financing uh, of project, uh, projects subject to EP4. So again, this is something that relates with ESG and with the global development of uh, and raising the bar of, of social, environmental and, and, and governmental compliance. And this naturally includes uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, just to give you a, a, a reference, 10% of the Mexican population is indigenous. That's over 12 million people just in Mexico. Just to make this abundantly clear, just in Mexico City, we have 129 indigenous communities just in Mexico City. And EP4 is telling us you need to, you need to consult, you need to comply. And this is here to stay, and uh, I think that this is something that is with, I think that is very relevant. Yeah, thank you. And apologize for not introducing uh, the background, the corresponding background, sorry, of you. All the full background is in, in the home page. Uh, Jenny, from your side, on the finance standpoint, uh, given the fact that it's very different to understand that consent from, from a consultation or as a, an act of authority, how do you see that from a financial standpoint and managing and, and president of, of Lifting Fund, how is your experience on how, how those additional issues would be traded in the finance project and the planning of those infrastructure projects? Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you this morning. Isn't it great to be out in public and be uh, with each other? This is, this is my first out. I'm coming out uh, to, uh, to, to make a presentation. Uh, virtually, we've been doing it for a long time, right? But in person, so this is the first one. So let's switch gears a little bit when he's talking about um, the infrastructure and the dollars and the financing for these kinds of projects. You're talking about zeros and zeros of dollars into uh, into the equation, right? So millions and millions of dollars. So now let's focus a little bit on the smaller financing, the working capital loans that small businesses need and so on, because it takes everything. The inclusion includes everything because of those big projects, where are those people gonna go and eat? They're gonna go to that truck, you know, that food truck or where are they gonna be able to buy the stuff that they need for that day? It's those microempresas that are around, um, surrounding these uh, bigger projects. So let me talk a little bit about the about Lift Fund and micro enterprise and micro credits first, and then we can talk about specific projects. So as you all know, um, microfinance started in developing countries. You know, working capital for the working poor, very small, small loans. I remember, you know, LIFUN's been around 27 years now. I'm actually the first employee. And uh, for my training, I went to Mexico City, to Guatemala, 
looking at these you know microfinance uh, organizations, nonprofit as well, because Lift Fund is a not-for-profit organization, and seeing how this financing would work. Well, it was very simple. For example, in Mexico City, you had a, a family who lived um, uh, you know all together in, in a barrio and Colonia, and they had um, uh, what their business was selling toothpicks. So you go to their house. And one room was literally a mound of toothpicks. And their business, family business, was to get the toothpicks, put them into little plastic bags, you know, staple them, and the daddy would put them in the backpack and then go to the restaurants and um, pharmacies and all sorts of places to sell these. And this is the way they made their living. And they had, an, you know, a decent life. Can you imagine doing that in the United States? There's no way that we would be able to have an industry like that. Did you have a you know, certificate of occupancy? Do you have a health permit? Do you have this, this, the, all of these things, right? But the concept of working capital for hardworking individuals who cannot get loans anywhere else in the United States is what we wanted to start and bring because that had not been done much in the United States. What we wanted to do was level the financial playing field, right? So what we mean by that is just because we don't take care of our credit scores in the United States. If you don't have a decent credit score in the United States, you are going to pay more for the same product, right? You're going to go, if you're going to go buy a car, you go to the, the dealership, same car, two people want to buy the car. If you have a high credit score, you're going to get a low interest rate on that car. If you have a low credit score, you're going to pay a higher percent. So in most cases, that same car, same value, someone with a FICO score that is low is going to pay three to four thousand dollars more than the person who had a decent credit score, right? And that's just the way it is here in the United States. So what we're trying to do is level and educate people on that FICO score and you know, educate people on how the systems work here in the United States. Over 80% of our portfolio, which we have about a $70 million outstanding portfolio right now, are, um, are minorities. 75% of our portfolio are Latinos, right? And so who is it that we work with are people that are minorities or women-owned businesses that can't get credit anywhere else. And we, have, we lose our best customers because and that's a terrible business model, those of you in business, right? You want to keep your best customers. But in our case, we want to lose them because we want them to graduate from our program and go into the traditional financial institutions. So we report back to their credit bureaus their payment history with us. So therefore, by borrowing money, paying it back on time, is how you increase your credit score. Simple as that. But we have to train people on how to do that. And so that's what we've been doing for the last 27 years. And now we started here in San Antonio in 1994, same as NetBank. And then uh, now we are in 15 uh, states, uh, all along the southern uh, part of the United States, from California to Florida. We just opened in, uh, in New York. And we have about 100 employees. And a lot of it is done now by virtual, uh, and especially last year, uh, doing applications online and applications on our website. So we've learned how to be able to mitigate that risk. Because remember, banks can't, you know, if you have a credit score of less than 680, banks will not give you a business loan. They'll give you a credit card, but they're not going to give you a loan. And so um, we, like I said, have an outstanding uh, portfolio right now, about 70 million. The average credit score of one of our customers is about 600, and we have a 96% repayment rate. We've learned how to mitigate risk. People are good people, most people anyway. There's 4% out there that are not so good. But 96% are good in terms of wanting to be able to, um, to feed their families, right? So there's a saying that, you know, you give somebody a fish, they eat for a day. You teach somebody how to fish, they eat for a lifetime. Well, what we do in our work is that we help people buy the pond where they fish, and now they own something. And that's how you break that cycle of poverty and how you help the next generation. It's because you have an asset. It's not just income coming into your home. It's an asset that you're building. and so. To, you know, you're probably thinking, why are you here? And why is Janie talking about this and with all these other uh, bigger issues? It's because it's the economy there, the jobs that are being created by these microempresas, the, the jobs that are sustained, the families that are taken care of. 
and then the, the education, right, that we provide. That uh, it's not only the, the access to capital, which should be, to your point, you know, justice, right, that everybody should have access to capital, but it's also access to education uh, and access to succeed. So with that, I'll pass it back on to you. Thank you, Jenny. And Gustavo, from your side, has public um, claims and from the governmental organization, non-governmental organizations, uh, even in, in other cases as fighter with certain policies and in Mexico. Uh, from Senda's perspective, what is that issue that at how in the border uh, uh, region should be addressed certain infrastructure projects and how the human and environmental rights for, and the corresponding social impact should be traded in the upcoming years from your side. Thank you for being here. Gracias. I'm going to speak in Spanish if you don't, if you don't mind. I understand that we have translation, so I feel a little bit more comfortable speaking in Spanish. So I apologize for those. <laughs> Um, gracias eh, al NatBank por la oportunidad y por la invitación. Es un gusto estar aquí con ustedes. Yo también es la primera salida, muchas virtuales, pero es la primera presencial y creo que hay que empezar a movernos ya con las precauciones debidas en esa dirección. Eh, quisiera empezar eh, comentando a qué nos hemos venido enfrentando y nos enfrentamos todavía hoy en día en eh, problemas ambientales a lo largo de México, para entrar después un poquito más a detalle en la parte legal y de la legislación eh, ambiental. Eh, por ejemplo, los problemas que se comentaban cuando se negoció el primer eh, NAFTA eh, siguen vigentes hoy en día. ¿no? Eh, por ejemplo, la contaminación de los cuerpos de agua, prácticamente todos los cuerpos de agua en el país están contaminados, no dicho por un servidor, sino dicho por la propia autoridad ambiental. Tenemos eh, problemas muy serios de deforestación, que ni siquiera conocemos los, las cifras. Si ustedes se meten a Google van a encontrar cinco o seis cifras diferentes, pero es, es alto el, el, el número, el porcentaje. Eh, la erosión de suelos eh, sigue fuerte. Hemos perdido 75% de, de los manglares eh, en el país y seguimos en, en esa dirección. Por supuesto, eh, mal manejo de residuos peligrosos porque no hay infraestructura en el país para manejarlos eh, adecuadamente, no obstante que estamos eh, como parte del convenio de Basilea y que tenemos un acuerdo con Estados Unidos para eh, el manejo de, de los residuos peligrosos. Hay un problemón en México al respecto. Eh, la sobrepesca sigue fuerte también, el tráfico de especies, no obstante que tenemos la norma 059 y que somos parte del acuerdo CITES, el tráfico de especies sigue muy, muy fuerte. Eh, así como decía yo de los ríos peligrosos, pues también tenemos un pésimo manejo de la basura a nivel nacional y a cualquier parte que te presente el país, lo primero que te encuentras desgraciadamente es, es basura. ¿no? Obviamente contaminación atmosférica, no solo en la Ciudad de México, Guadalajara, Monterrey, algunas ciudades fronterizas y otras que no hemos logrado eh, detener. No obstante, por ejemplo, que en la Ciudad de México empezamos en 1988, ¿no? con el programa de verificación vehicular, el programa de no circula, etc., no, no logramos contener. ¿no? Y obviamente pues el, el tema de pérdida de áreas verdes y el tema más relevante hoy en día a nivel global pues, es el tema del cambio climático. Entonces, todo esto presenta enorme reto, pero también oportunidades, ¿no? sobre todo para la parte de, de la frontera y, y para financiar proyectos para atender justamente estas situaciones. Eh, y, y un tema más también que vale la pena agregar a la lista es el, el, el mal funcionamiento o incluso la, la inexistencia en muchos lugares de las plantas de tratamiento de agua, ¿no? lo cual es un problemón de contaminación a nivel nacional, particularmente eh, en aguas marinas. Ahora, ese es la parte mala, digamos, la parte negativa, la parte del reto, el obstáculo, pero ¿qué avances ha habido? Pues también hay que decir que ha habido cosas positivas, ¿no? Por ejemplo, México tuvo su primera ley ambiental en 71, 50 años atrás, ¿no? 
pero después tuvimos la ley de 82 y después tuvimos la ley de 1988, que es la ley que está vigente y que obviamente hay que meterle mano porque ya es una ley que está viejita, pero hay un avance en, con, con respecto a la legislación. Pero también hay un avance constitucional. Si ustedes revisan el artículo cuarto de la Constitución Política de los Estados Unidos Mexicanos, se van a encontrar con el derecho al agua, el derecho a la salud y el derecho a un medio ambiente sano para... El, la salud y el bienestar de las personas. Eso pocas constituciones en el mundo, hay que reconocerlo, lo tienen a, a ese nivel. Pero también tenemos muchos otros marcos jurídicos ambientales o indirectamente ambientales, como es el caso de la Ley General de Cambio Climático. Pocos países en el mundo tienen leyes de cambio climático. Tenemos una a nivel federal y algunos estados de la República Mexicana ya tienen su propia legislación ambiental, como es el caso de la Ciudad de México. Pero además tenemos ley de agua, tenemos una ley forestal, tenemos la ley de vida silvestre, tenemos la ley de transición energética, muy importante hoy en día por los embates que tenemos en el país en contra eh, de las energías renovables por parte de, del gobierno federal. ¿no? Y además tenemos una multiplicidad de reglamentos, como es el reglamento en materia de impacto ambiental, y una multiplicidad de normas sociales mexicanas en, en materia ambiental. ¿no? También vale la pena mencionar que... Eh, algo que ha sido relevante en estos últimos eh, 28 años es eh, el cada vez mayor involucramiento del Poder Judicial en la resolución de los problemas ambientales, lo cual no sucedía anteriormente. Incluso los jueces, los magistrados, los secretarios no tenían conocimiento de la legislación ambiental. Cuando dimos los primeros cursos solicitados por el Consejo de la, de la Judicatura Federal, nos decían, aquí nadie sabe derecho ambiental. ¿no? Le estoy hablando de hace 20 años. Hoy la situación es completamente distinta, incluso a nivel de la Suprema Corte de Justicia de la Nación ya se están tomando eh, decisiones muy importantes, muy trascendentales eh, en materia ambiental. También dentro de los avances, pues hay que decir, México tiene 180 áreas naturales protegidas de competencia federal, muy importante tener esos decretos, esas declaratorias presidenciales, pero ¿cómo le hacemos para que en la práctica las podamos sostener, que las podamos realmente mantener?, y también hay que decir que ha habido una, una evolución institucional, ¿no? Eh, no solo a nivel de la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente y Recursos Naturales, sino también tenemos una Procuraduría, ¿no? que es la Procuraduría Federal de Protección al Ambiente, que se encarga del enforcement de la legislación ambiental, pero tenemos una Comisión Nacional Forestal, pero tenemos un Instituto Mexicano de la Tecnología del Agua, tenemos una Comisión Nacional del Agua, tenemos una Comisión Nacional de Áreas Naturales Protegidas, tenemos una agencia de seguridad, energía y ambiente para el sector hidrocarburos, es decir, mucha, mucha institucionalidad y uno se pregunta por qué tantos problemas ambientales en México ¿no? cuando tenemos tantas instituciones que están abocadas a solucionar eh, los problemas ambientales. Obviamente eh, hemos enfrentado también eh, muchísimos obstáculos, ¿no? uno de ellos para nadie sorpresivo pues es la corrupción, ¿no? que ¿Cómo no va a haber corrupción cuando un inspector de la Procuraduría Ambiental gana 8, 10 mil, 12 mil pesos al mes? Pues eso es una cosa completamente insostenible. ¿no? Pero también encontramos que las instituciones no tienen dinero suficiente. Comentaba yo en la mañana en el desayuno que el sector ambiental, eh, medio ambiente, recursos naturales en México en los últimos siete años ha perdido el 59.5% de su presupuesto. ¿no? Entonces, con esa pobreza presupuestal, ¿Qué van a poder hacer las instituciones? Pues prácticamente nada. ¿no? Incluso hasta se les va a poder eh, acusar de omisión ¿no? por no cumplir con sus responsabilidades en función de que no tienen presupuesto para hacer su trabajo. Entonces, no hay recursos humanos suficientes, no hay recursos financieros y, por supuesto, no hay recursos eh, materiales. Falta, ha faltado mucha capacitación, mucho entrenamiento, por supuesto, en, en materia de derecho ambiental. Hay problemas de coordinación y de comunicación a nivel de, de las instituciones. Eh, y algo que me parece que es fundamental y posiblemente lo más importante es la falta de voluntad política ¿no? para entrarle a los temas. Ahorita tenemos una administración completamente contraria a los temas ambientales, completamente contraria a las energías renovables, eh, que está promoviendo refinerías y carboeléctricas eh, en el país y que está eh, yendo en contra de la reforma energética de la administración anterior para efectos de volver a los años 60 o a los años 70 y depender del petróleo y del carbón y no estamos yendo realmente hacia la transición energética. Entonces, hoy en el país no hay voluntad política 
para los temas ambientales y me parece que es eh, muy importante. Si bien eh, también hay que reconocer que hay muchos eh, espacios de participación social en la legislación ambiental mexicana, eh, falta que estos sean más utilizados por la gente. Ahí están, ¿no? son amplios, son muchos, los podemos comentar más adelante, pero hay mucha oportunidad de participación social relacionada un poco con lo que decía Héctor eh, con el acuerdo de, de Escazú. Y también parte de los problemas que hemos visto es que muchas veces las leyes están mal hechas, están mal redactadas, no tienen la técnica jurídica que deberían de tener, o que a veces las leyes, los reglamentos, las normas se, con, se contraponen eh, unos para con otros y eso hace difícil la implementación de, de la legislación. O también hemos encontrado muchas veces que hay invasión de esfera entre los tres niveles de gobierno, no, no obstante que la ley ambiental a partir de su, de su artículo quinto establece que le toca a cada quien de la federación, los estados y los municipios, hay invasión de estas esferas y ahí se vienen problemas jurídicos importantes. Y finalmente decir que eh, parte de la problemática que hemos encontrado es que las sanciones también son muy bajas. ¿no? Si alguien viola la ley, pues de acuerdo a la legislación ambiental tienes una multa de 50 mil días y si eres reincidente, 100 mil. ¿no? Pero pues eso no compensa un daño, no compensa una afectación, no compensa un un desequilibrio ecológico. Entonces, tenemos que seguir batallando fuertemente en México, no obstante estos casi 30 años está en la lucha, porque los intereses eh, económicos se siguen anteponiendo a los intereses ambientales en lugar de que vayan eh, de la mano como debería de ser ya a, a estas eh, alturas del partido y poder asegurar que las instituciones perduran y se mantienen en el tiempo. Siempre he dicho que Estados Unidos no necesariamente es el mejor ejemplo, pero a finales de los 60 crearon la EPA, hoy existe la EPA. En México a partir del 70 creamos una Secretaría de Medio Ambiente y hoy han pasado seis Secretarías de Medio Ambiente diferentes. ¿no? Entonces imagínense lo que implica todo ese cambio eh, a nivel de, de las instituciones. Así es que pues no, no quiero ampliarme más, hay mucho que decir, eh, pero seguramente en las preguntas o comentarios posteriores podemos agregar. Gracias. Gracias, Gustavo. Um, me parece que hay un tema institucional, un tema de desarrollo sobre la economía en ciertas jurisdicciones. Héctor, desde tu punto de vista, ¿importa el tamaño de los proyectos con respecto a lo que significa esta evaluación, los impactos, ¿cómo tratarían desde tu perspectiva a partir del tamaño que señalaba Jamie este tipo de problemática? Um, from my angle, which is the indigenous people side, um, size doesn't matter. It's about the impact. I always use an example try to try to make this visible. And it's a uh, a power post, you know, uh, where you put the uh, electricity line. Um, if I tell you, Marco, I'm going to put a new post outside of your house, do you, does that impact you culturally? Is it relevant? No. It's, it's something, it's there. It's probably even going to improve the infrastructure for you. That's fine. Now, if I tell you we're going to put that same post, the same thing, exactly the same thing, in the atrio of the Basilica of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and it will probably block a little bit of your view. Does that impact well, you? That's an issue. But why? The same post. Yeah. Okay, but it's different. Okay. <laughs> so that's the thing. We need to be able to understand it's not about a thing, it's not about a project. It's about a project in a specific time, place, and cosmogony. We need to understand and make visible the invisible. That's a catch. I need to, just in Mexico, we have 62 different indigenous tribes that occupy a huge chunk, a chunk of the Mexican territory and represent 10% of the population. That's 62 different cosmogonies divided in thousands of tiny communities. And we don't understand the, their worldview. We don't understand their sacred places. We don't understand their intimate relationship with the environment. We don't get it. How are we going to be able to determine the level, level of impact if we don't really even understand the most basic thing, what is sacred to them, what is relevant to them? That's the catch. So in our view, the only way to work around this is 
doing adequate social impact assessment before the impact is caused. How do we do that? Well, the same way that we do an environmental impact assessment. We have to understand the project. We need to talk and relate and have, uh, I like to call Mr. James Anaya, uh, very, uh, his insights are always amazing. Uh, he, he says that uh, free prior informed consultation is an, a permanent and continued intercultural dialogue. It doesn't go away. It's not about getting a permit. It's about talking to the community, understanding their worldview as it evolves throughout time with the project. And based on that, being able to reach agreements and obviously share benefits in the end is their ecosystem. So um, yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's about talking about uh, understanding. Prior understanding. Correct. <laughs> Jamie, okay. from your side, given that we have several issues on the bureaucracy, on the development, on the interaction between local and federal laws, in your perspective uh, as as developer for small, small um, companies and small uh, business, how we can try those difference between cultural, economic, impact, and all the things behind that problems that we can address in the upcoming projects. That's right. For example, sorry, for, for example, for energy transition, which is more complex because at the end you have, behind that you have a target, a sustainable target in that term. Yes, yes. So I, I think that the, the thread is the answer is yes, it encompasses all of that, right? Um, and if you think about um, the impact statements that we're trying to make is jobs, you know, creation of jobs, and then also the economic impact of, of taxes. You know, one of the things that people avoid in the United States is paying taxes. Where can I have, find a loophole to do that? Well, what we're trying to train is that paying taxes is a good thing, because that means that you're successful, and then at the end of the day, what are the taxes good for? The taxes are to build the economy in that city, or state, fed, or the federal. Because at the end of the day, it's the taxes that pay to help somebody else that doesn't have what they need, right? So that's where we, that's where we find our dollars to be able to help the homeless and the people that need to eat and the people that need to food on their table and so on, right? So um, it's a multiplier effect. It's really, you know, that one little thing that hits and then it goes like this because what we tell our borrowers, it's you're helping not only yourself, you're helping the whole economy um, because you're creating jobs, you're um, buying supplies from somebody else, helping them with their job and so on. So um, it, the, the threat is there and, 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 and in terms of the size, so we've learned over the years is that it, de it depends the life cycle of the business, the size of the loan that, that they need. In some cases, a loan may just be $5,000, $10,000. But in some cases, they need three to $5 million because of a new uh, project that's come up or so on. So over time, we've been able to provide these different products. We make loans from $1,000 up to $5 million right now, depending on what your need is. And 100% of the people that we serve still can't go to the bank, right? Even though they need $5 million and we can provide them the $5 million, the regulations for the banking industry does not allow that customer to go there, right? So um, we fill that gap for um, the, the un, uh, I, I call it the underserved, right, that, that, that are out there. I don't know if that answered your question. But. Yeah. Okay. Gustavo, um, para estos proyectos, dado que el problema no está en el proyecto mismo, sino en cómo y dónde, y sobre todo los impactos que desde nuestra perspectiva mantenemos, ¿cómo ve la perspectiva el SEMDA en este tipo de situaciones cuando son proyectos que justifican trabajo, que justifican Eh, incluso energía limpia para ciertas, ciertos proyectos. ¿Cómo ve el Senda esta parte del desarrollo de proyectos de infraestructura? Me parece que es una muy buena pregunta y lo que siempre hemos dicho es que 
más que bienvenido el crecimiento, el desarrollo, la inversión, la creación de empleos, porque además son necesarios, los necesitamos, ¿no? Y más hoy en día, como está la situación económica y pandémica a nivel mundial. Lo que también siempre hemos dicho es que eso se tiene que hacer eh, respetando el capital natural, ¿no? respetando y cumpliendo el marco jurídico aplicable y respetando eh, los derechos humanos de, de las personas. Si eso se cumple atinadamente, acertadamente, nosotros creemos que los proyectos deben ir adelante. ¿no? Eh, y yo creo que una manera de poder eh, asegurar certeza jurídica para los mismos, una, porque hay varias, pero una es a través de dar un cumplimiento efectivo al procedimiento de impacto ambiental. ¿no? Porque los principales problemas que hay en México son por impacto ambiental. O sea, los problemas grandotes, los problemas que están en la prensa, en los medios, que causan, que causan polémica, que causan eh, problemática social, que causan toma de oficinas, eh, protestas, manifestaciones en la calle, etcétera, tienen que ver con el procedimiento de impacto. ¿no? Entonces, tenemos que hacer toda una reformulación del procedimiento para efectos de poder garantizar certeza jurídica para los promoventes, ¿no? porque además está su, su, su capital está en juego, ¿no? está en riesgo pero también asegurarle a la gente que el proyecto que vaya a venir no es un proyecto destructivo, no es un proyecto que los va a hacer a un lado, no es un proyecto que les va a quitar su territorio, que va a acabar con, su, con sus eh, formas de vivir, con sus tradiciones, con sus costumbres, que es lo que la gente tiene miedo. ¿no? Muchas veces no es que la gente se oponga a los proyectos, a veces se opone porque no los consultaron, porque nadie les preguntó, no obstante que hay una obligación legal eh, para hacerlo a nivel nacional y a nivel internacional, pero muchas veces no se dan estas consultas o no se dan apropiadamente. Entonces me parece que tenemos que hacer una implementación adecuada de esos instrumentos que ya están a la mano y al mismo tiempo, como decía yo hace un momento, tratar de eh, promover a nivel del poder ejecutivo y del poder legislativo una reforma importante al, al, al marco eh, jurídico ambiental, particularmente en lo que tiene que ver con materia de impacto ambiental, para, por ejemplo, que ya no sea la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente y Recursos Naturales la que evalúe el impacto ambiental y la Secretaría de Energía la que evalúe el impacto social, sino que sea un solo, un, un solo instrumento ¿no? donde se, hay, se haga una evaluación de impacto socioambiental, y si le queremos llamar de otra manera también, o agregar más cosas también, pero eso también ayudaría a simplificar mucho eh, el trámite para efectos de los que quieren llevar a cabo los proyectos. Ok. Regarding the impact, Hector, did you see, according to your experience, any difference between a infrastructure project in the border or in, a, in other place in, in the country that, given that difference between ethnic or cultural differences within Mexico? Yeah. Um, the border is a, is, a, is a very challenging place to, to develop a project. Um, why? Uh, because culturally, uh, indigenous peoples, tribes, communities uh, have been there for eons. They don't really care about the borders. Um, a very clear example of this is uh, there was this uh, very cool project uh, that was going to be built or the, prior administration in Mexico uh, intended to build a, a very interesting, a huge T-line that would interconnect Baja with uh, the rest of the Mexican network. Um, uh, that in the end, that project uh, fell through and it, it, it didn't happen uh, because of political motivations uh, mainly. But uh, it was a very interesting project from a cultural perspective. Uh, because when, when we, we carried out a, a social impact assessment study, we realized that uh, there were only two ways to build a T line. One was uh, close to the sea, a uh, huge environmental impact uh, because of the uh, Baquita Marina. I don't know how to say that in English, uh, but I, I think that everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, so there are a bunch of natural protected areas, uh, very complex area to build in. So that, 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 that was not going to happen. So the alternative was to just build a T-line literally uh, as close to the border as possible. That presented a physical problem because of the, uh, there's a huge desert there, the Desierto del Altar, 
very hot area, very difficult area to, to build on. But also we realized that there was this, uh, there's this uh, indigenous uh, community uh, who uh, lives in the United States, who are called the uh, uh, Toto, uh, the Odan tribe, the Odan tribe, um, who have this sacred rite that they call La Ruta de la Sal, or the, the route of the salt. So what they do is that in, in the becoming of men, in their worldview, they have to walk through a number of sacred routes. They actually walk through the, the, this desert of Altar uh, for weeks and walk from USA into uh, Rosarito or the, the beaches in, in this area of the Sea of Cortez and take salt and bring it back to the community. It's not about the salt. I mean, the salt they can buy it everywhere, but it, it's a cultural thing. It's the becoming of a man. So, um, and, and it's impressive. I mean, this, this tribe has been able to walk through deserts for eons and survive. Uh, I mean, at, at temperatures way above 100 Fahrenheit. It's ridiculous, it's absurd. But here's, here's the, uh, the catch. The catch is that I have to assess the social impact assessment because I'm gonna build a t line over this area where they have uh, traditionally walked through these areas and survived. Survived against the roughest, toughest environment in the world. But they have a human right to cultural intimacy and they won't reveal this their sacred routes to me because it's sacred and it's it's a secret it's part of the worldview how do i assess an impact of an infrastructure if i don't know where they where this is so that that that's if that project happens that's going to be happen that's going to be fun um uh, and 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 again this is very peculiar because it's a binational conflict it's an american tribe but who they have a cultural right to a piece of the mexican territory so that's going to be fun let's see yeah i think that the most important result of that is that we have no specific or standard procedure in terms of what we need to do or what we need to understand Correct. in each of those projects. Correct. Uh, Jamie, from your side, have you a, a strategy in connection with that particular issues? For example, uh, as a fund, do you have a specific or, or you have certain diversif diversification on, on your projects in connection with that particular uh, matters in, for, for each assessment? Yeah, what a, what a great story. And it talks about culture, right? And so in our culture, in our community, borrowing money is not a good thing, right? That's, we've been taught, we've got to save and then we can do whatever it is. And also in our culture, we've been, you know, we have the, the, the I forget what they're called, those grupos that get together and they, one, la tanda. Uh, so um, those, but it's really, what you're doing is your own money just moving around, right? People don't know how to use like when I was growing up, my parents never talked about the stock market. You know, that wasn't something that we sit around the kitchen table and talk about. But how to reach people get rich using somebody else's money. And how to, you know, how do you uh, use your money well is how you build assets, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what culturally we have to talk to our community and say, look, let's learn from the best, right? Let's learn how we can do this and increase our own um, families and leave legacies. Um, I, I think in a culturally too, the way our families did it before uh, was rental houses, right? So and so was leaving in the neighborhood, they'd go and buy, mom and dad would go buy that house, they would rent it and that was their form of equity and that was a form of building assets. But now it, who can buy a house right now, right? <laughs> So let's think, you know, you know, even teaching people how to use um, savings accounts and money market accounts and all those kinds of things. I had a lady come in with cash one day because she we, all, we, we, um, we require collateral on all our loans because what we've learned is that if you don't have skin in the game, they're not going to pay you back, right? So uh, this lady, she said, you know, she didn't have any collateral. So here she comes to the office, literally, I'm not joking, a shoebox with hundreds of dollars in there, cash. So she's kept it, and if the house would have burnt down, you know, where would the cash have gone, right? So these are the kinds of cultural things that we have to address all the time and, and getting the trust of people that this is okay, the banks are okay, it's FDIC insured, you know, uh, 
you you know we're not going you're not going to lose any everything and most most people don't have more than $250,000 anyway in savings so you're insured for the whole 250 right so um, so anyway that's a that's our culture way that we that we feel deal with families and culture thanks Marco, yeah. we have about 10 minutes yeah oh, i don't know if you want to ask one more question or if you want to open yeah. up to the audience members please. Uh, any members of the audience would like to ask questions of the panelists? Okay, Marco, please, I guess you can continue <laughs> with your question then. Yeah, I think that my, my question is just for, for Gustavo. Gustavo, estamos viendo que no existe un, un procedimiento estándar y que no siempre los derechos ambientales van a estar alineados con los derechos culturales. Más allá de que pueda existir un procedimiento como el que propone socioeconómico a nivel de legalidad, ¿no? a nivel de autoridad, ¿cuál debería ser, desde el punto de vista tuyo, cuál debería ser esa dirección que debe tomar los, los proyectos cuando esos derechos están peleándose entre sí? Sí, se escucha. Sí. Yo creo que una de las cosas que también hemos aprendido a lo largo de estos años en México es que independientemente de si está en la ley o no está en la ley, si se contrapone o no se contrapone, eh, ha faltado mucha sensibilidad eh, en ocasiones por parte de los promoventes o de los desarrolladores, incluso de, de la banca o del sector financiero que al final es el que pone el dinero para que los proyectos vayan adelante. Eh, ha pasado muchas veces, por ejemplo, que te dicen, es que si no lo hacemos ahorita ya no nos van a dar el crédito. Entonces yo les digo, esa prisa es la que los va a matar. ¿no? Esa prisa, ese acelere, es el que hace que el proyecto se caiga y se vaya para abajo. Entonces, lo que, en mi experiencia, lo que yo siempre he sugerido es que hay que tener muchísima sensibilidad para poder, eh, independientemente, como sea yo, de lo que diga la ley o no, poder eh, bajar al terreno... Eh, ser muy humildes, ser muy sencillos, acercarse con la gente, platicar, hacerles ver los beneficios, hacerles ver que pueden ser socios del proyecto, hacerles ver que van a generar empleo, hacerles ver que les van a, a mejorar las, las condiciones, eh, por ejemplo, de salud eh, o las condiciones eh, deportivas o de los caminos o la electricidad, no sé, muchas cosas que que se beneficia a la gente, pero como no hay, como muchas veces hay como arrogancia y hay prepotencia por parte de los que quieren hacer los proyectos, porque dicen yo traigo 500 millones de dólares o traigo mil millones o traigo lo que sea. ¿no? Entonces eso los hace sentirse los poderosos y no bajar al terreno y sentarse y platicar con la gente. Entonces creo que esa sencillez y esa humildad para decir, oye, vamos a platicar, ¿no? Porque Muchas veces nos hemos dado cuenta que o las ONGs o las comunidades ni de chiste se van a sentar con el desarrollador. Y, y al contrario lo mismo, el desarrollador o el inversionista ni de chiste se quiere sentar con los ecologistas. Cuando no sabe ni uno ni el otro qué es lo que quieren. ¿no? Y, y, y se los digo porque en una negociación en una ocasión había una... Eh, una toronja en, en el medio de la mesa y se la estaban peleando las dos partes, ¿no? cuando en realidad ese pleito pues, no tenía razón de ser. ¿no? ¿Por qué? Porque el de este lado quería la cáscara ¿no? y el del otro lado quería lo de adentro. Pero como no estaban dispuestos a entablar un diálogo, como no estaban dispuestos a tener esa humildad, el proyecto no se pudo llevar a cabo. Comunicación. Exacto. Efectivo. Muy bien. Ok, uh, I back to you. I, I don't know if we have another question. I have a question. Please. Well, there was two questions. So, John, you can go first and then. Yeah. Okay. Brody Burks. I'm with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. 
One of the things that I'd like you to, to talk about, and this was uh, sort of in specific to the anecdote of uh, Native American tribes needing needing access to water, is if you talk about water just sort of more generally in this context, um, that's something that TCEQ works quite a bit with, is uh, with NADBank, with IBWC, uh, our partners across the border in Mexico trying to figure out the best ways to make water availability um, equitable across across nations, across uh, communities. So I'd ask you, you talk about that, uh, the water access in these, this context a little bit. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, water is an issue, always. Um, there's a big cultural difference and legal difference between US and Mexico. And Gustavo here, obviously you, you, you have this much more clear than I do. Uh, but um, from a constitutional perspective, water in Mexico is not an asset. It is a human right. And it is defined by law as such. So you cannot own what is not yours. Water is owned by the Mexican nation, uh, except for rainwater, technically. But other than that, it is, it is a national asset. You cannot buy a national asset. You cannot sell a national asset. Um, and from a cultural perspective, water is a human right. Um, this creates a huge problem from a cultural perspective. Um, as Gustavo was saying, every once in a while, particularly with, with hydro projects, uh, it's not about the power you can produce uh, with, with the water. It's about who is stopping or receiving less amount of water because of the project. Uh, and, 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 and the absence of an adequate and timely dialogue with these communities is what causes problems. Um, in my experience, uh, I had a very, very quick um, uh, story. Uh, I was dealing with this mini hydro in Chiapas, and uh, we, we engaged in intercultural dialogue, and I was having this humongous resistance by the community, but I couldn't pinpoint what it is. Um, so in the end, what we did is that we divided the community in, in, in men and women. Because under that particular community, women uh, are not expected to talk uh, uh, as part of, and that is, I'm saying that that's right. I'm just saying that that is what in that culture is acceptable. So when we were able to actually talk to women alone, we realized that the problem is that women didn't want the project to bring water to their houses which was like, I, 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 don't, I don't get what you're talking about. I mean, you have to walk a mile to get access to water. We're bringing the water to your place. I don't get it. And the answer was so quirky. What they said is, I don't want you to bring water to my house because it is my duty to bring water to this house, not yours. And second, if you bring water to my place, then where are we women supposed to talk? Cheese me. I, I, it, it, I, was, I was blown away. It was more relevant to women who have a space of their own where they could be themselves and, and share than actually having water at their house, in their house. Different world please. John, final comment for the panel, please. panelists because this was a very difficult topic and it's one that was stretching our imagination here at NADBank when we were designing this conference and one of the thoughts and goals we had was to really bring the conversation about sustainability and the environment and the climate change agenda to the border really requires us to try to reconcile uh, you know the economics the social and the fairness question, which is really, if you will, uh, it, if we get down to brass tacks, can be efficiency, fairness, and and uh, sustainability. I think you guys did a really fine job of illuminating the the trade-offs and these different dimensions of these problems that I think the border region as well as our world are going to confront. So thank you very much. That's really my comment. Calix from Salvador, if we can have John and come up, all three of you, please. Thank you very much, panel. We'll take a quick panel.
Can we get another round of applause for the panelists? Thank you. Well, we're right on time. We have a 15-minute coffee break. Please come back at 11.30 to hear about uh, a binational air quality fund by TCEQ Commissioner Bobby Janeka.